Hello and welcome to Carrying Through in Advanced Metastatic Urothelial Carcinoma, Expert Perspectives on Recent Practice-Changing Data and the Practicalities of Individualizing and Continuing Care with Novel Immunotherapy Maintenance Strategies. This activity features Professor Thomas Poles from Bart's Cancer Institute in London, Dr. Petros Grievous from the University of Washington Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, and Professor Johan Lorio from the Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris. So over the past few years, we've seen some major shifts uh, on the treatments available to us in urothelial cancer. Um, before we uh, look at those advances, we're going to review some of the challenges to frontline treatments. Um, this is a super uh, overview, a super overview, in that we managed to get the whole of bladder cancer onto one slide. NIBC, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, uh, treated um, a spectrum of different approaches moving towards BCG. Um, which is the mainstay of high-risk disease, a regular cystoscopy for the vast majority of those patients, muscle-invasive urothelial cancer, which is T2 to T4A, N0, or, or dare I say it, N1, uh, M0 disease. And those patients treated with neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy surgery. And obviously there's a discussion now about adjuvant uh, nivolumab, which is one which is, uh, is an exciting discussion for the future, I think. Uh, there's also a piece around chemo radiation, which is popular in components or aspects of North America and the UK. I think we need to see more data on chemo rad, but what data we do have looks really good in my opinion. Um, I think the next piece uh, really is then locally advanced and unresectable disease, which uh, is an area which we don't have enough data on. And I guess that's T4B, again, N1, uh, how do we treat these patients? I think a multidisciplinary approach is the right approach. And then we're off to recurrent metastatic disease. And this is what we're going to talk a lot about today, first line and second line therapy. The challenges with um, front line treatment in metastatic disease. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the median survival advanced disease has remained stubbornly static for a long time. Patients, the median survival is somewhere between nine months and 15 months, depending on the trial you look at and the treatment of the patient. Uh, we focused very much on first line platinum containing regimes. We're seeing responses or stable disease in the majority of patients. But the real challenge has been that as soon as you stop the chemotherapy, the cancer probably starts drifting in the wrong direction. And the median progression free survival is only four or five months. Um, and then I think the second issue then is when those patients' cancer progress, it can be pretty devastating. Second line therapy, most patients don't get it. Those patients that do get it, we've been using, well, in the distant past or the, the, meet, the sort of distant past, we were using taxanes and vinflunine, and that's now switched to immune checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab with Keynote 45 with a randomized phase three data, atezolizumab widely used also. Um, and, I, and I think that that this pattern has been in place probably for uh, the last couple of years now. This, this slide here is pretty striking, but what I do see is a problem in that we have a lot of bladder cancer patients, we've got a high morbidity, uh, but we haven't got that many patients getting first line therapy, second or even third line therapy. What's going on there? Tom, this is a great question. So this data is in collaboration with Dr. Agrawal and Dr. Swami from University of Utah. And what we see there is a significant attrition. A significant proportion of patients do not receive first-line therapy. And as you see, if someone receives first-line therapy, only about 20% get to second-line therapy uh, and uh, even 6% third-line therapy from the data with Dr. Swami. And this was a little bit older data around 2018 just showing how difficult it is to keep patients in line, keep patients in the train of treatment because of you know, clinical deterioration, decline of uh, health, performance status, and access to care. So I think this data definitely support the idea and the concept of how we can sustain, how can we maintain benefit in the frontline treatment so we can maximize the, outcome, the best outcome for the patients. And we see this data across the board in all of those publications, only a small proportion get to second and third line treatment. 
Johan in Paris, it, I guess the story is similar. I think in my practice, the majority of patients get second line therapy, but maybe that's not true. Maybe we just forget about those patients that progress quickly and don't do well. Uh, we don't have some so, such data here in Paris, uh, but my feeling is that um, 50, 60% of the patients receive second line, but as you, as you said, uh, uh, some patients progress very quickly on chemotherapy and are not fit enough to receive second line. So I'm not surprised by the, uh, this data, as we, we don't have the data here uh, in France or maybe in Europe. Um, Petros, those patients that progress quickly on chemotherapy, we're going to talk about some, some data in a minute. Those patients that progress quickly on chemotherapy, who are those patients? And is there any treatment better than chemotherapy for these individuals? Tom, I think in, you know, in my personal experience, about 20% of patients, about one out of five patients, have progression in upfront uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. So if you flip that number, about 80%, four out of five, have either response to stable disease. And those patients you know, are those who have very aggressive clinical behavior and usually do not respond to many other therapies. So in my experience, those patients usually do not respond that well to immunotherapy either. I think there is some overlap in the patient population for response to chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So I think it's very hard to salvage those patients. You know, obviously, I think if you go to community sites versus academic sites, you may see a difference. And in my practice, I would say, you know, uh, there is a selection factor who comes to see me in Seattle, but in the community practice, you may see patients with a little bit more poor protoplasm. Now with, you know, novel agents like antibody drug conjugates, target therapies, we may be able to salvage some of the patients, but traditionally it has been very hard to treat those. So I think that uh, this is a summary slide showing the degree of the problem. Strikingly, less than 50% of the patients getting first-line therapy. That seems um, much lower than, than, than I'd like. I, I, I guess we probably treat, I don't know, maybe 75, but it is a challenging disease. And I think starting first-line therapy is really important. One of the things I say, we'll talk about a little bit, is getting first-line therapy right is really important, because I agree that only 17% of patients getting second-line therapy. So when we select first-line therapy, it's important we get the right treatment. Um, there's also a lot of inequality regarding access to therapies across Europe uh, and access to clinical trials. And um, one of the things which, which I'm, you know, which is apparent, I think, is that urothelial cancer tends not to be treated by urothelial cancer doctors, but by GU cancer doctors, um, and that it's part of, often a small part of someone's busy day-to-day -day practice. What influence, Johan, do you think that's had on the way we treat our patients? I do, I do agree. I, I think uh, many patients are treated actually in in um, community uh, center, so meaning that maybe it's uh, um, oncology that do lung cancer, bladder cancer, maybe kidney cancer. So I think the uh, the message we, we we try to release is that uh, if the patient has a bladder cancer, he should be referred to an expert center to select. The, the, the right treatment at very, very early when the patient is diagnosed metastasis, but because as you said, I think the most important um, way we have to treat the patient is to select the, 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 the most powerful uh, first line uh, treatment. So it's very, very important message. So um, I guess one of the questions we're gonna ask uh, and Petros is gonna drive on this is how we uh, reach updated guidelines and how we can implement them. And so over to you, Petros. Thank you so much, Tom, and great discussion with you and Johan, always enjoyable. So I will start by saying that we always, as you mentioned, try to improve upon the outcomes of patients with advanced urothelial cancer. And as you pointed out, we have you know, good response rates with GEMCs, maybe about 55, maybe 60% in some series. And with CarboGEM, the response rates now approach 40, 45% in modern data. The, the challenge is the durability, how long these responses last. And that's why the, the concept of a maintenance therapy has emerged over the years. And I know both of us have been involved in that uh, arena. The, the mechanism you know, in my mind is how can we think about the effects of chemotherapy and how could those effects you know, interplay, interact with the immunotherapy effects, the effects of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So and there is now emerging data, especially with cisplatin, by Dr. Galski and other colleagues, that in addition to direct cytotoxic effects, 
chemotherapy, platinum-based chemotherapy, can have potential immunogenic effects. And in this slide, you see the potential of immunogenic cell death that could be very relevant in you know, our design of clinical trials. For example, if you have immunogenic cell death from platinum-based chemotherapy, can you follow this with immunotherapy, immune support inhibition, to capitalize on that and try to you know, uh, increase the ability of the immune system to recognize cancer-related antigens and stimulate an immune response? And this uh, slide, uh, I think, has a summary of different trials trying to improve upon the outcomes of patients in first-line setting. And on the left side, uh, you see the maintenance trials, and we'll talk about the Javelin Bladder 100 in a second. As well, and I won't make sure other colleagues know, there is also another trial by Dr. Galski and colleagues presented at ASCO a couple of years ago from the Fusier Cancer Research Network with switch maintenance Pembro versus placebo that showed the progression-free survival benefit was significant, uh, but there was no overall survival benefit in that study, about 107 patients. In the middle column, you see attempts to combine chemotherapy and immunotherapy uh, and uh, those trials like in 361 uh, in Vigor 130 were presented and also the ongoing Checkmate 901. I just want to also point out their attempts to combine different agents. For example, the right column, you see the Dano trial that Professor Pauls presented uh, recently that combined durvalumab tremelimumab, a double immunotherapy combination compared to chemotherapy. That was also a trial that did not meet the primary endpoints. And uh, also we have ongoing efforts like the Checkmate one with Pinevo versus chemotherapy and the EV302 with a very exciting combo, pembrolizumab plus and form of a dot in versus chemotherapy. So as we just discussed a minute ago, the Invigor 130 trial, trying to answer two different questions. The first one was platinum-based chemotherapy plus concurrent atezolizumab versus platinum-based chemotherapy and placebo. And uh, with the investigator assessed progression free survival and overall survival as endpoints. And the second question was atezolizumab versus chemotherapy, uh, atezolizumab monotherapy versus chemotherapy. And you see here the couple of layer curves that Tom alluded to. You see on the left side the PFS. There is a modest progression for survival benefit with a concurrent addition of a tissue to platinum based chemotherapy. But I would argue personally this is not clinically significant, hazard ratio 0 0.82. And uh, the, 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 the couple of major curves are very close to each other. The median PFS difference was about two months. And, and as I mentioned before, the time of data cut, what Dr. Grande presented at ESMO 2019 there was no significant overall survival benefit at that time. And still, about two years later, we have not seen any significant overall survival benefit with longer follow-up. Similarly, in the Kinot 361 study, we actually had a similar question, pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone, or pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. And again, in that trial, uh, showed no significant difference in either PFS or OS. Uh, you see there's no significant difference. There's no significant benefit by the concurrent uh, combination of chemo pembro versus chemotherapy alone. And this is the data that, uh, Tom, you presented and uh, pretty much what I said before. We have the combination of durvatremi in intent to treat population in all comers, regardless of PDL1 compared to chemo, that uh, did not reach significance. And also durvalumab alone by itself in a select population based on PDL1 high expression versus chemo and durvalumab was not able to beat chemotherapy, even the pd selected patients. And even in the previous Kinot 361 trial, Pembro alone did not beat chemotherapy in pd one high CPS 10 or higher. We have to see also what the checkmate 901 shows. And to remind the audience, this is a phase three trial, the frontline setting with Pinevo versus chemotherapy with his gem cis or gem carbo. And we're going to see the data uh, in different subsets of patients, including pd one high to see what happens there. But definitely there was a trend to Tom's point, but did not reach significance. So, so far, uh, what we have shown you in, in, in brief, three important trials in Vigor 130, Kino 361, and Danube, all those three trials did not change practice. So again, the concurrent approach of chemo-IO we discussed before did not pan out so far. Uh, there's the Checkmate 901 also has a GEMSYS NIVO versus GEMSYS still ongoing, but so far, concurrent combination of chemo IO does not work that much for overall survival. What about sequencing approach? And what about this maintenance concept to try to keep more patients in the train of treatment <clears throat> without clinical deterioration and ensure access to care? So as I mentioned briefly before, there have been two trials, uh, the phase two Hoosier Cancer Research Network uh, with Dr. Galski showing the data about a couple of years ago. 
we have pembrolizumab versus placebo with a crossover design. I want to point out that only about half of patients, about 50% or so, crossed over from placebo to pembrolizumab upon progression, just showing you how difficult it is to salvage patients, right? Even in the context of a crossover design, a phase two trial, only half of the patients crossed over to pembrolizumab from placebo. And on the right side, you see the phase three double better 100 trial that Professor Pauls presented at the uh, ASCO plenary session of 2020, and I'll show you the data here uh, in a second. Tom, do you want to briefly comment on the idea of maintenance? I know you and me have been have tried even before with targeted agents. Any quick comment on the concept of maintenance in urothelial cancer? I mean, the first investigator initiated trial I did in, in urothelial cancer was a randomized phase three or phase two stroke three maintenance trial. The reason why I think I've always felt it's an attractive principle is it's clear that chemotherapy is good at getting initial control of the cancer. But as time goes by, almost all the cancers become resistant to that chemotherapy. And so, but we also know that if bladder cancer, you let it grow, it just, you let it grow and it causes problems really fast. So that control is really important. If you can get in control of the cancer with chemotherapy, why not then give the immune therapy? Because it's the best of both, both worlds. Chemotherapy, great initial control, but doesn't maintain it. Immune therapy, not great initial controls, but can maintain the control with chemotherapy. Thank you, Tom. Great. I'm here uh, showing you the data from the switch maintenance uh, pembrolizumab trial. Again, PFS significant benefit with Pembro versus placebo in the maintenance concept. These are patients who have response to stable disease to first-line plant-based chemotherapy. They got up to eight cycles. And then uh, on the uh, right side, you see overall survival. Uh, there was no significant difference between the two arms. Um, again, the crossover was about 50%, uh, and the trial sample size was uh, 107 patients. And that brings us to the Javel Bladder 100 trial. Uh, this was a lancetomized phase three study patients with local advanced are resectable or metastatic urothelial cancer, regardless of the primary tumor origin, uh, after response to stable disease to platinum-based chemotherapy, uh, they got randomized with either avelumab and the PDL1 and take mix per kick given every two weeks, plus best supportive care or best supportive care alone, uh, with a treatment-free interval between four and 10 weeks between completion of chemotherapy and initiation of the uh, uh, randomized uh, treatment in the trial. Primary endpoint were overall, was overall survival in the overall population intended to treat, but also in the subset of patients with pd one high tumors. The patient was stratified based on the best response to first-line chemotherapy and site of metastasis. And as you see here in the slide, there was a significant overall survival benefit with Avelma plus best supportive care versus best supportive care alone. Uh, as you see, the hazard ratio is 0 0.69 uh, with a very significant p-value and clear separation of the curves early on, you know, from the fourth month or so. And the middle of the survival difference is more than seven months of uh, showing significant benefit with the anti pdl one avelumab as switch maintenance therapy. And this is overall population regardless of the pd one expression. And as you see, about two-thirds of the patients are alive on, at 18 months, which I think is very exciting as we know, the historical data with this disease are very, very poor. So seeing these numbers is very, very exciting. I think it's changing somewhat the natural history of disease. And this is the subset of patients with pedal positive tumors. As you see here, this is an even lower hazard ratio, 0 0.56, very significant p-value, high uh, degree of separation of the curves. And about 70% of the patients are alive at 18 months. I would say, you know, very, very high degree of benefit and exciting to see this data. And overall, uh, as you see, and as you have heard, uh, on June 30, 2020, the FDA approved Avelumab as switch maintenance therapy in patients who have achieved disease control, meaning response to stable disease to platinum based chemotherapy. And this has level one evidence, and this is adopted by NCCN guidelines, ESMO guidelines. It is now approved in multiple countries. It was also approved in the European Union by EMA and multiple other countries across the world. So I think the practice has changed dramatically it's really exciting to see these improved outcomes, you know, in those patients across the board. And obviously, I want to see how the data, say, you know, uh, evolve in the future with longer follow-up. Uh, very exciting. Tom, I will turn this back to you now. I've got three cases here. They've got different characteristics. And we're going to just talk a little bit about um, 
you know, these patients that should be offered chemotherapy. And clearly on the left-hand side, it's reasonable to say, Jason, a young man, good renal function, PO on positive, but it's not so relevant because they're eligible for cisplatin-based therapy. Um, and they do really well with therapy, six cycles given. Maria, um, slightly, oh, not really, about the same age, um, same, um, uh, but the performance status is two. I think performance status is so important in this disease. Those patients that don't, aren't in great form at the start, you know, they get fatigued in my opinion. And then Ellen on the right-hand side there, um, interesting that um, she's a cisplatin eligible patient, but only managed three cycles um, because of adverse events, fatigue and neutropenic sepsis. Um, Johan Petros, how often do you switch across? Would you have switched Ellen across to give her gem carbo? What sort of dose reductions are you making with neutropenic sepsis? Let's make the assumption that she was doing okay on cycle one and then grade two fatigue on cycle three and with an, an admission for a week with neutropenic sepsis with a neutral count of 0 0.1. How would you approach Ellen? Probably for this patient, I will switch to carbogel um, with maybe those reductions uh, from, uh, up front for carbo, just to avoid the neutropenia. Uh, but it, I think it's very important that we can try to give this patient four, five, or even six, but at least four cycle, uh, just before we know that this patient has achieved partial response and sh she should be offered available then. So I will switch to carbo to this patient, yeah. I, I, you know, that's a great discussion. I, I think the first thing I would do is uh, if the patient can still get through chemo, I would probably dose reduce the I mean, in this case, this probably might drive the bone marrow suppression. Carbo is a little bit more myelosuppressive than cisplatin, and I may dro drop the gemcitabine dose first uh, and then see if I can get another cycle with, you know, hydration and best supportive care and try to get the patient to a fourth cycle, to your point, and then I can see if I can give more or not, uh, and individualize the decision based on benefit and risk, if I give four, five, or six cycles based on toxicity and response status. Johan, um, it's over to you, really, to talk a little bit about some of the Javelin 100 data and some of the subset analysis. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tom. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of relevant postdoc analysis for daily practice, actually, that were performed in Javelin Bladder 100 trial. So I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the first important question is whether or not PDL1 expression may impact the benefit from avalumab. So important enough that there was no significant difference uh, between patients with high versus low PDL1 expression. All patients benefit from avalumab regardless of PDL1 expression. It looks like that patients with high PDL1 expression benefit even more from avalumab, but I have to remind that interaction test was not significant. So meaning we, we don't need to look for PDL1 expression before uh, using uh, Avelumab. So maybe in terms of biomarker, so it's a complex story. So do you think that it's impossible to get a, day, uh, a good biomarker for immunotherapy, including Avelumab? So what do you think? I, mean, I think my take on it at the moment, Johan, is that the PDL1 biomarker has been really inconsistent we have many different ways of measuring PDL1. It's a protein stain with, I think, a lot of variability. I think the TC staining and the IC staining, tumor cell, immune cell staining have different significance. I think we were a bit, perhaps, we were a bit naive about that to start with. As it currently stands, whenever we've done a positive, whenever we've done a trial and had PDL1 as the primary endpoint, Danube 361, 211, um, 010, whichever one you want, it's always failed. Um, and so my feeling actually is we need to move on from this biomarker. Uh, we've had four or five big randomized negative trials for monotherapy. Now it might be for combination therapy, it might be different. For neoadjuvant therapy, it might be different. But as it currently stands, we're really battling with this and we need to move on. I would agree with that, Tom, and I, I think PDL1 has been a suboptimal biomarker, you know, in this disease and has a limited role, and we have to think further and beyond. 
Another question, the role of the uh, site of metastasis. So we know from other studies like, you know, uh, 045 or MVGO, they were 11, that, uh, 2211, sorry, so that patients with visceral metastasis and especially those with liver mets benefit less from immunotherapy. And in Javelin, again, the interaction test was negative, indicated that avidimab should be offered regardless of the site of metastasis. If the patient, of course, achieve at least a stable disease after chemotherapy. So overall, the slide here showed that there is no clear subgroup of patients that did not benefit from the uh, maintenance strategy. So if now we go into uh, details, there is a, a good question of the type of chemotherapy. She is very less effective if the patient had been treated first with carbo versus uh, cisplatin. So actually not. Uh, you can see here that uh, um, in terms the, of overall survival on top of PFS at bottom, the patient treated with frontline cisplat or carboplatin combined with gems are all benefit from uh, maintenance avidimab. So as other ratio are very similar and no significant, uh, significantly different. Next question, should we give avidimab? as maintenance if the patient achieve very good response. So PR or even complete response. So sometimes patients are fed up with chemotherapy uh, due to cumulative toxicity, fatigue, neuropathy, or because they want a break actually. So there is no, if there is no lesion of CT scan, should we give avidimab? That's the question. So the postdoc analysis here, indicate actually that there is no good reason to avoid avalumab to, uh, in this patient. The patient benefit from avalumab regardless of the quality of the response. Look at the PFS curve at the bottom, as other ratio are similar across the three subgroup regarding overall survival on the top, no clear difference again, interaction test was negative. So Tom Petros, it is something that the patient wants after the chemotherapy just to have a, a long break and not start it Avelimab because they achieve complete response in your experience? Johan, it's a good question. You know, patients definitely, you know, uh, are eager to get off treatment, you know, especially after chemotherapy and, you know, some toxicity they have accumulated. Uh, overall, that's their mindset. But I, I have a dialogue with the patient up front at the time of the decision making, the frontline setting, and I discuss with them that we achieve response to stable disease then the plan would be to do switch maintenance avelumab, of course, if there's no contraindication, and the patient has this in their mind. So uh, we try to start as soon as we can, uh, usually a month after the uh, completion of chemotherapy, in patients with either CR or PR or stable disease. And I want to just make a quick point that the CR subset is probably underpowered there with low number of events, but in and the benefit is across the board, it's notable across the board, and I use it for CR, PR, or stable disease. Don't I don't have much to add. I, what I would say is that the majority of patients who are getting into trouble with cycle four, five, and six of chemotherapy, I think that's a really important issue because, you know, if, you, if you're pushing the patients through toxic treatment, they're causing lots of side effects. Yeah. Then, of course, switching to a new therapy, many people say, listen, I need a break. I think it's quite important that we, and the benefits of cycle four, five, and six of chemotherapy, well, I think most of the benefit, honestly, is in the first three cycles. So I think it's reasonable to look at those three cycles and dose reduce, dose delay, omit some of the regimes. We talked about that in some of the previous cases that we're going to come back to in a minute. What I would like to do is have my patient in as good a place as possible at the completion of chemotherapy. And also, I don't want really long delays in that chemotherapy. So as soon as you've got more than a two or a three week delay, if it's cycle six and it's a three week delay, you know, you might as well stop, in my opinion. I think that that, that that's an environment where you said, listen, let's switch across to immune therapy a bit early. Thank you, Tom, for this uh, very good uh, transition. So the question is, does the number of cycles impact the benefits of every mom? So please remind that the, the, the patient were allowed to be enrolled if they had been treated with four, five, or six cycles of chemotherapy. But is there any difference between four or six? So the response is no, clearly. So we infer the number of cycles of chemotherapy received by each patient on an enrolled in Javelin. And you can see here there is no difference between four and six. 
actually few patients receive only five. So, so this subgroup is probably not informative. So the conclusion is among patients who stop first line chemotherapy prior to six cycles, so meaning four or five, avelumab maintenance still provides a novel survival benefit. So coming back to your question, Tom, are you aware of any trial that maybe investigate a, low, a lower number of cycles? Yeah, because I think we're doing a study, and I'll talk about that in a second. I think what this data shows, it doesn't say it's, it's safe to give shorter periods of chemotherapy because um, we, at the moment, six is the standard of care. But for those who can't tolerate chemotherapy, main switching to maintenance of Alimab is the right thing to do. We've got a trial in Europe, and Johan, you and I are doing this with Enrique Grande, and the three of us, I'm really excited to work with friends in investigating initiated trials. It's going to be super cool, I think, because um, we're doing three cycles versus six cycles, followed by maintenance of Alimab. Quality of life is, is the primary endpoint. But, you know, it's conceivable that by short, shortening the chemotherapy, the immune therapy may work even better. So um, I think it's going to be a really exciting study and it's going to be a European thing. We're going to do it together. The trust in yourself? I think, I think you have a great discussion. I, I personally uh, try to get uh, to three cycles and then I do restaging scan and then see what the response uh, and the uh, benefit is. And then I, I balance this with toxicity. And if the patient it can tolerate treatment, uh, I will try to go up to six cycles, which is a standard, as Tom said. But if the patient is struggling despite some dose adjustment, dose reductions, and doesn't get too much benefit, have stable disease, but significant toxicity, uh, I, I, I can stop at four cycles and then you know, go to systematic and surveillance and the, and the data support that approach, which is individualized benefit risk ratio. As Tom said, we don't have much data with less than four cycles, but if a patient has substantial toxicity, and cannot get through, you know, beyond three. Sometimes you can extrapolate, but uh, but the, uh, the, and, and and switch there. But the, the javelin had four, five, or six cycles, so it's individualized. And I'm interested to see what your trial in Europe show. This question: uh, Should we start Avelumab right away after the last cycle of chemotherapy, or is there any possibility to give a break to the patient? So in the trial of Avelumab, had we uh, started four to ten weeks after the last cycle of chemotherapy. So let's see if there is any impact of the treatment-free interval. So you can see here that as a ratio is quite similar, around 0 0.7 in the three different groups. Uh, so early, intermediate, and late start of avelumab. So the treatment-free interval does not impact on the activity of avelumab. So here are a couple of additional analysis. So we have to be uh, very careful because the group are not well balanced, of course. So what we can say is that there is no sign on to exclude a subset of patient uh, for avelumab based on the primitive locations of the tumor, so upper tract versus lower tract, or the site of metastasis. Another complex question arise with regard to the biomarker. So as you know, a lot of biomarkers are being assessed to predict response to immunotherapy in oncology. So what has been done first was to look at the TCJ classification. So you know that we try to classify MIBC and there are many different classifications. So here, if we use TCJ subtime, it looks like there is no clear trend and indicated that a subgroup does not benefit. Maybe a luminal subtype, but again, the numbers of sample in this category is so small that it is not significant, actually. Um, Tom Petros, any uh, maybe promising biomarker in the field, in your thought? We've seen data that innate and, act and um, adaptive immunity are both required. Uh, active macrophages, so M1 rather than M2. We've seen some data on dendritic cells, which I think are exciting too. Um, I think that there are other pieces which are moving forward. I quite like the circulating tumor DNA data. Uh, I think that as a surrogate marker for minimal residual disease, but also monitoring progress is relevant. The problem with TCGA analysis is it's a classification that was originally designed based on the RNA signatures across all of cancer, not just the immune signatures. And so they've clustered cancers together, but there are various different components of the immune signatures within those. And so it's always going to be very difficult to use these to define treatment for immune therapy. I agree with Tom. I think there is so much excitement in the field about biomarkers, and we do a great job with discovery, 
but to prove clinical utility of a biomarker is a very high bar. And in different trials, we may measure a little bit different things and different biomarkers with different assays, which makes the clinical utility challenging. I would say uh, I'm very excited about the, the things that Tom mentioned. You know, we have a very good program in the Javelin Bladder 100 trial, and there will be a manuscript will be published very soon. Um, it's actually accepted and will come up very soon, looking at different biomarkers tested in Javelin Bladder 100, which I think raises great hypothesis for the future. Uh, I think things like TMB and PDL1 are, you know, uh, are interesting, but not probably adequate. Uh, CD8 T cell density is uh, relevant. We looked at also uh, at FC gamma receptor polymorphism, DNA repair gene mutations. I think overall the message is we are not ready yet to select patients for Avelma based on any biomarker. I would just you know, uh, offer it to any patient who could respond to stable disease. But I think the future hopefully will, you know, more dissection of the mechanism and serial tumor DNA that Tom mentioned, hopefully will have, you know, biomarker design trials. I agree. Thank you. Um, moving now to the safety. Uh, there is no new signal, actually. Safety profile is very consistent with what has been previously reported with avelumab or other immunotherapy with fatigue, pruritus, GI toxicity, the most frequent adverse event. So adverse event led to discontinuation of avelumab in 12% of the patient. There were some deaths that was attributed to by the investigator to the study treatment, so avelumab uh, in two patients but very, very, very rare. So important enough when a therapy is given for a long time, like avelumab, uh, it's important to see if there is any impact of quality of life. And here, avelumab, first line maintenance, so uh, improve our survival with no effect in impact on the uh, quality of life. So it's very important to check and it's very uh, important to know that there is no uh, big impact on quality of life. But of course, sometimes patients stop avelumab due to immune toxicity. So what are the, the guidelines? Uh, usually if toxicity mild or moderate, we can withhold immunotherapy and use corticosteroid if needed, and we can rechallenge the treatment then. If the toxicity is serious, we have to discontinue immunotherapy, maybe envision hospitalization and high dose corticosteroid. So Tom and Petros, so do you, have, do, do you set up any um, multidisciplinary approach to manage the toxicity in your center? And, and how you can, you, you can provide some tips for uh, the audience, for example? Sure, I, I can go quickly and then Tom can comment too. Uh, in our center, University of Washington and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, we have actually set up a tumor board and multidisciplinary tumor board and we actually invite not only oncologists, but other specialists, right? GI, pulmonary, rheumatologists, cardiologists, et cetera, depending on what the case is. And that actually has created a, a lot of enthusiasm. We have actually one later today and we present interesting cases. So this tumor board is very relevant and educational. We also have developed an email listserv where you have a case that you want input right away. You can email and there are representatives from each specialty, medical specialty across the board and that can provide input real time and get the patient very quickly to see a specialist. So this email listserv has helped us a lot. And then there are dedicated clinics. For example, our rheumatology colleagues have set up a dedicated IRA clinic and they see the patient right away with a very short time until notification and see the patient in the clinic. So it's a multidisciplinary approach that has helped us a lot. And you know, we still learn as a team to how to diagnose early, educate the patients and optimally manage IRAs. So I think that the key is to have a group of individuals with skin in the game who uh, have um, a, uh, an, a desire to work together for these patients. But ultimately most cancer centers in, well, particularly with, you know, urothelial cancer, it's a relatively small number of patients. You know, of course, bringing endocrinologists for um, complex endocrine toxicity, gastroenterologists in for persistent diarrhea, um, and in fact, hepatitis, some, some of the hepatologists at our center are really interested in that. It's a great question, uh, actually, about how we develop this, because it has to be a balance between the clinical team who are in front of the patients looking after them and the background team, the wider team investigating and getting it right. As part, so as part of this education activity, uh, additional information regarding um, the, uh, the, the management of this uh, toxicity are offered here and you, you can download 
uh, these uh, guidelines for you, your staff, and your patient, of course. So maybe uh, we can go back to the clinical case and maybe uh, Tom, you can take over. That's sweet of you. Um, what are we doing? Are we giving this patient, he's tolerated treatment well, let's say he's four weeks out, he's come in for his CT scan post chemotherapy. It's terrific news. Uh, CR is terrific news, but you know what? It's not like a CR in other cancers. It's not like a CR in kidney cancer with immune therapy. The median progression-free survival of these patients is only between four and six months. And the majority of patients, the vast majority progress subsequent to that. So, you know, most patients who get CR, I think are expecting more than a four month PFS. What do we, uh, what do we, how do we approach these, these patients? Um, and perhaps Petros, you'd like to start. Absolutely, Tom. I think the, the challenge we have is, as you correctly said, we don't have a reliable biomarker to tell us who is going to progress and how quickly. And I think invariably, uh, you know, uh, there is a very high risk of progression. I think the durable CRs are a very, very low uh, chance. It's a very small proportion. And traditionally, conventionally, we have seen probably about 10% of patients, maybe with lymph node only disease, having a durable CR. So my worry is that this CR in the vast majority of patients is not long lasting. So I definitely uh, give these patients Avelimab switch maintenance and uh, the, the other point I want to make is if we look at the CR subset, the PFS was significant in favor of Avelumab, and the hazard ratio for overall survival was 0 0.81, despite it was an underpowered subset analysis, and there was no treatment by subgroup interaction there. So I definitely would uh, give this patient CR because I'm worried about under-treating because I cannot pro you know, predict the future reliably. So I will definitely give, give Avelumab in that case. Let's move to the second case, and this is Maria, who's slightly older. Um, her performance status was two when we started, and she was given gem carbo. She had a partial response, but only had four cycles of treatment. She was fatigued, and it uses the word frail, and hesitant to continue, uh, and asked for multiple treatment breaks on chemotherapy. This is one of those cases we talked about previously. Um, and I guess my opinion is that those patients progressing with five and number six cycles of chemotherapy is often counterproductive. Um, Johan, what's your take on this lady and what do you do next? I think probably uh, I will try to switch to Avelumab uh, because it's clear that the patient is fed up with chemotherapy. She wants uh, a break. So we have 10 weeks to set up uh, the Avelumab. So maybe we can offer a, a, a small break for this patient, a short break to this patient, but we should convince this patient that Avelumab uh, improve primarily the control of his disease or her disease. Um, so I will try to convince this patient to be treated with Avelumab. I think it's a good candidate actually. Let's move to the third and final case. So Ellen's more complicated because she did really not that well with chemotherapy. Neutropenic sepsis fatigue, grade three, um, which is stopping treatment completely. Was cisplatin eligible? Actually quite young as well. What would your approach be, Petros? So the, the question here is, do, can we go more with uh, chemo in that case? Uh, this patient has a partial response. She had significant toxicity, got admitted in the hospital with neutropenic sepsis. You know, it's a discussion with the patient. I would probably try to dose reduce gemcitabine at least by 20% and maybe give a growth factor support. To, to, to try to get uh, uh, this patient through at least another cycle of chemo, if possible. And then I will see how well she tolerated. And then I will make a decision about four, five, or six cycles, repeat scans if there is response stable disease. At that point, I would switch to available maintenance. If the patient completely refuses more chemo, sometimes this happens despite discussion and counseling. I, you know, I, we can extrapolate uh, and give available map now, but the javelin blood at 100 had between four and six cycles of chemotherapy. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to do that in, in the UK because you'd have to give the four cycles of treatment as per the label. Johan, what would your take be on giving that four cy fourth cycle? Uh, would it be single agent carbo? Would it be day one, day eight? Um, would you just give single agent gemcitabine? Um, obviously, it was neutropenic sepsis that scared us. You know, if we reduce the doses of the drug, we could probably prevent that happening again if we were careful, particularly with the gemcitabine, what would your take be? 
Sorry, I will remove the, the ape from Jamzar uh, and maybe the one or so, uh, but keep, of, uh, of course, a platinum uh, based chemotherapy, so either cisplat or carbo, but probably I will remove the, the at least the eight and probably the, uh, the one of Jamzar. So I think I'd do the same. I would then see how she gets on with day one, day eight um, carbo. Um, and then if she does really well, on the first one and doesn't have too many problems, you know, reintroducing gem at fifty percent. Would that something you'd be interested in? Or if you've given that fourth cycle, all, all you're trying to do is you're trying to get her across the line to get maintenance of valumab. Or if she does well on cycle four, would you go to cycle six with suboptimal chemotherapy? So is this patient? Um, it seems that this patient is quite frail because after after three cycles there is a lot of toxicity, grade two fa uh, fatigue, grade three neutropenic sepsis. So probably I would just stop at four, not giving six, and again switching very early to avidimab. I guess. Yeah. What do we do? Where do we land now with these different approaches? Uh, I'm just going to uh, give a quick overview of my opinion. I'm going to start on the right hand side, if I may. I think second line um, in pembrolizumab or atezolizumab, and I see them as interchangeable, are, is associated with um, a good outcomes, but for not enough patients. And therefore the first line approach is more attractive. And I think it's reasonable to say overall that this maintenance approach seems to be preferable to the other approaches. Um, we talked about some biomarker work for the future and, you know, it's quite complicated uh, in some ways. Um, here we've looked at the tumor and immune component biomarkers um, associated with the Javelin 100 data. And you can see the TC tumor cell expression hazard ratio 0 0.35 versus 0 0.61 for IC. Perhaps tumor cells is more predictive, perhaps um, tumor cell, sorry, perhaps immune cell more predictive, tumor cell more prognostic. And on the right hand side, you can see gene signatures. And as I said previously, dendritic cell macrophage, natural killer cells, adaptive, but also important innate immunity associated with response to therapy. There are other trials on the horizon, uh, ongoing maintenance trials, CABO plus Evalimab. Um, we've got a PARP inhibitor plus Evalimab. Johan, I think that's a study out of France. Um, We've got um, Patriot 2, which uh, I think is um, uh, an exciting multi-center study uh, with, with first line of Valimab. And of course, we've got the DISCUS study, which Johan and I talked about previously. Um, so questions from the community for everyone, really. Um, and let's start with the top one. And perhaps, Petros, you'd like to do that. Tom, I think, uh, you know, there are many barriers if we think about across the globe, you know, access to care is probably one of them. And, you know, I'm thinking not only in the US, but I know in other countries. So I think access to care and healthcare delivery is very important to make sure these medications that prolong life, like available to be accessible in patients across the globe. And of course, elimination of healthcare disparities. And this, even within the US, there are disparities in terms of geographical distributions. Patients who live like in you know far away distant rural areas may have a long travel you know to come to the cancer center. So we try to you know address that you know by providing some support in those patients if we can. The other thing is toxicity from chemotherapy and the patients want a break that Johan mentioned before, and that's what takes a discussion with the patient. And as I mentioned, my take is we have the uh, four to ten uh, treatment interval. I err on the side to start treatment earlier than later to avoid progression, but I think it, this depends on the discussion with the patient. The third thing, you know, if we think about, you know, the complexity of care these days, you know, infusion rooms in cancer centers get full. So we need to have more space, right, for our patients who live longer, which is a good thing that they live longer and we want them to live longer. So you have to not have enough capacity and obviously the cost of the healthcare system overall, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, treatment of patients, you know, management of IRAEs that we discussed before. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, having patients uh, living longer and better with uh, qual good quality of life, you know, is very, very important. Johan, any differences between Europe and the United States in terms of what you've just heard from Petros? I think the uh, no the the problem of reimbursement is not a big problem in many countries in Europe. So in uh, in the vast majority of the uh, in Europe, uh, the uh, very member is is reimbursed. I think the the most important point maybe is the awareness of uh, oncologists in the 
community practice, I would say, because you know um, there is some oncologists doing lung cancer, uh, GU cancer, GI cancer. So uh, we should maybe uh, try to find a way uh, where um, the, these oncologists are aware that avelumab is approved and, and the patient need to be treated with avelumab as maintenant. So it's a matter of education, meeting, uh, and, and interaction between expert center and uh, all the oncologists in daily practice. Let's just talk about the final point on this. How long can you use maintenance regimes? Um, um, Johan, how long do you, would you give it for? Is it until progression? Is it a maximum of two years? Is it, have you got an algorithm in your mind? Uh, it's a big question. So, so we, we don't know exactly. Um, so usually I go to two years and after two years, we have a discussion with the patient. So just to remind that in a javelin trial, the patients were treated until progression or uh, withdrawal or safety problem, uh, if, um, um, toxicity, sorry. So that's a, a discussion case by case again. And there is some uh, clinical trial in different countries in Europe and probably in US where the duration of uh, immunotherapy is addressed, not only in bladder cancer, but in oncology in general. So maybe we will have some, uh, some response and some tips to address this question, which is still difficult at this time. Johan, know, from a patient's perspective, um, let's start at the top as well, and perhaps Petros, you could kick off on this question as well. Um, why, um, why do we need both from a patient's perspective? Um, I mean, maybe I'll take that one. I mean, I guess that it comes back to that principle of get initial control with chemotherapy, which is hard with immune therapy, maintain that control with immune therapy, which we can't with chemotherapy. Um, can I have a break between um, chemotherapy and immune therapy? I think it's reasonable. Johan showed those slides. Yes, you can, it's up to 10 weeks. I think if you get the chemotherapy right and there's not too much toxicity, uh, my preference would be to be somewhere between four and six weeks. Remember, bladder cancer progresses quickly and, and it's important that if you've got that control with chemotherapy to not let it slip and the cancer progress, in my opinion. Um, and why can't I keep going with chemotherapy if it's working? And um, which one of you two wants to take that question? is toxicity mainly toxicity right that you know neuropathy fatigue bone marrow suppression and other accumulate toxicity i think you know the more cycles you may hit wall at some point so i think i usually stop at six cycles if the patient cannot tolerate well it's my sorry maintenance lapasinib trial the original study we did we showed a 30 percent progression rate between cycle three and cycle six of chemotherapy many of those patients were having delays chemotherapy and weren't getting the treatment in on time and we current, we had a podcast, we did a Euromigos podcast with Dean Bajoran in our sort of legend series. And I asked Dean the same way of how he did, got, came up with the not he, how him and his colleagues came up with the number six. And the answer was that they started by just continuing. And if you do continue chemotherapy, in the end, the cancer grows through it. Uh, and so I think that was a really interesting uh, piece from Dean about how we, uh, how we got to where we are today. Remember in lung cancer, they give four cycles, not six. And actually they chose six to some extent as a compromise on what was going on in other tumor types. So we've got some take home points here. First line platinum based chemotherapy, I think is the preferred option for patients with metastatic urothelial cancer. I think we're unified on that. And this switch maintenance strategy enables more patients to receive immune therapy as part of first line therapy, rather than waiting till second line, which I'm afraid is too late for most patients. I think the overall survival and progression free survival benefits uh, speak for themselves. The hazard ratio of 0 0.69 is the lowest that we've seen. Uh, and I think that this um, is an important uh, continuality to try and bridge this gap uh, in the efficacy of clinical trials and real world data. We haven't seen that much real world javelin data yet, which I think is uh, uh, going to come in the not too distant future. Johan Petros, thanks a lot. Anything you'd like to say before we, uh, before we call it a day? So um, th thank you. I think it's a very important uh, activity that we did uh, today because I think we, we need a sort to, uh, to give uh, some update on the uh, changing landscape and, and obviously every man changed the landscape in the first line. So thank you for this activity. I, I agree with that. And, and I will just add that, you know, it's so difficult, as you know, Tom and Johan, to change practice across tumor types and have a phase the trial showing overall survival benefit and with no detriment in quality of life. So I think 
Uh, it's great to see this data improving outcomes, longer life, uh, longer progression for survival, and uh, a trend towards actually less clinical deterioration or delayed clinical deterioration. Uh, so hopefully we'll have even more uh, uh, outcome improvements in the future. Thank you so much for inviting me. And to thank our audience and also to remind them to, to that they can download the practice aids associated with this educational activity. Um, thanks again. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and, uh, and see you soon, I hope. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.